We're turning to Revelation chapter 2, and we're starting at verse 8, because we took the first of the seven letters to the seven churches in our last session, along with our treatment of the latter part of chapter 1. Somehow we got off kilter here. I, I, I prefer it if the session ends at the end of a chapter. It's easier to label the videos that way, and it's easier to... It's just... It's usually it's a good place to stop. Chapter vision, chapter divisions are usually, you know, logical places to quit. Uh, we've gotten off, however, in that respect. I hope that by the end of this session we'll be caught up to the point where we'll be at the end of a chapter, uh, possibly at the end of chapter three. But that means we have six letters to six churches to cover in about an hour and a half, which is not too unreasonable. That's only 15 minutes uh, per letter. I could easily take longer on most of them, but. But it may be it may be that we'll say all the important things about them in that time. So we'll we'll kind of aim at that. We we saw that the first letter that Jesus dictated for John to write and send was to the letter of Ephes uh, to the church of Ephesus. That was John's own church at this time in his life, according to the tradition that's been passed down to us from the church fathers. He spent his final years in Ephesus, probably as an overseer of all the churches in the area. Uh, we don't know for sure that that was the case, but it would make good sense, and it would explain why Jesus would on this occasion give him, uh, communicate to each of these churches. His own church first, Ephesus, was a church that was zealous for truth, uh, very intolerant of false teachers and false apostles, uh, apparently abundant in good works, religious activities, um, possibly even, you know, helping the poor and things like that, good things like that, but they had left their first love. Which is really an interesting thing for us to ponder because uh, he tells them to repeat their first works again, to go back and do their first works again. And yet he said that their labors have been abundant. Uh, they don't seem to be lacking in the quantity of works. And it would appear that the quality of their work is deficient. And he wants them to go back and do the first works that they did when they had their first love. Which seems to mean that the works that they had done before had been works that had sprung perhaps spontaneously from the love of God that was in their hearts produced by their walking in the Spirit. And it is easy for any Christian, I think, to lapse into the position that, whereas when they first got saved, they were so full of the Spirit, so full of the love of God, that they spontaneously did good things, they laid down their rights for others, they, they served people, they gave to the poor, they were willing to make sacrifices just because the love of God constrained them. Um, but as time goes on, even if you don't feel the liberty to stop doing those kinds of nice things, it's possible to get into some kind of a routine of doing nice things, giving a certain percentage of your money to a religious organization or spending a certain amount of your time uh, in outreach or in other things, and to do good things, but to not do them for the same reasons anymore, uh, so that things actually become burdensome. They, you still do them. You don't allow yourself the luxury of, of giving up these projects, uh, because you would consider that if you gave them up, it would be a mark of your spiritual decline. In a sense, those things which were spontaneous marks of your spirituality when you were earlier uh, walking with the Lord uh, become the measurement of whether that spirituality is still there. And as long as you continue doing the works, you assume that you're still as spiritual as you were then, whereas in fact, it may be just the desire to be spiritual or the desire to, to convince yourself that you're spiritual or others that you're spiritual that has now replaced love as the motive for doing these things. And um, I think uh, that a, a person for, to whom that has happened is not too, un, uh, not too uh, rare. I think that, that that's a fairly normal thing that happens in the religious life of people. But it doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it forgivable. I mean, it is forgivable if you repent. But And that's just what the Church of Ephesus was told to do, is repent and go back to the place they'd been before in, uh, in to their first love. <laughs> and so the threat to them is that Jesus would remove the, the lampstand, their lampstand, from the place where he was walking uh, if they did not return to their first love, which suggests that no amount of religious works is going to induce Jesus to put his blessing on a church. Uh, all he's looking for is love. Now, of course, love will produce works, but, but the love is the issue. The works can be there without the love, and Jesus cannot be there. And, or at least he can be in threatening to leave. And 
they did have the people there who did the deeds of the Nicolaitans. As we said yesterday, that's not entirely clear who those people were, but uh, it is thought by some that they were followers of a man named Nicholas who taught a Gnostic heresy of antinomianism that, that is, that taught that it was okay to sin and perhaps led people to be slack in their moral lives and still hoping that they were saved by their faith. Um, Jesus said he hates the deeds of these Nicolaitans, and later on we'll find a church has the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in it. Okay, we come to the second church now, in verse 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things, says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now this city was a very ancient city, Smyrna. And it is, from what I understand of the seven cities mentioned, it is the one that still exists as a city. And as I'm not improperly informed, there is still a small congregation of Christians there. Though, if you go to Turkey today, you'll have a hard time finding Christians. Uh, it is, of course, a very uh, dominantly Muslim country, and uh, it's rather more than a little sad to think that there were some, some major churches founded by the Apostle Paul and nurtured by no less men than Paul and Timothy and John, which churches at a later date simply gave place to, Muslim, to Islam. That doesn't mean that the converts became Muslims, but the whole area was given over to Islam. And we can't imagine that that would have been permitted to be the case by God if the churches had remained worth keeping around. Uh, the suggestion, of course, to the church of Ephesus is they were, in their present state, not worth keeping around. That's why he would remove their candlestick if they didn't repent. Um, Smyrna, however, is the one, well, one of the two churches that is not asked to repent. They're not commanded to repent. Of the seven churches, five are told to repent, and Jesus has something against them. But Smyrna and Philadelphia are, are exceptions to this. This is the shortest letter. And it, one reason it's short is that he doesn't have any complaint against them in it or a call to repentance. They are a suffering church. That's evident enough. This city was the oldest city of the seven in Asia. It was founded before the others were. And um, it's modern Izmir, as I think I mentioned. At a time later in its history, Polycarp was the bishop. And not much later, because Polycarp was a disciple of John, the writer of this letter. So... While Polycarp was probably not yet installed at this church at the time this was written, even if it were written as early or as late as 96 A.D., which some believe, uh, Polycarp probably did not become bishop there until the early second century. Uh, so some have thought maybe he was the angel of the Church of Smyrna, but not likely. It's, uh, it would be a later time. But this city also had the largest Jewish population of any of the seven cities, and. Uh, it seems that the Jews were creating uh, a problem for the church here. Let's just look at the church, uh, the, the letter piece by piece. He says, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now, these are expressions that come from chapter 1. In the vision that John had of Jesus on the island of Patmos, he, uh, he heard these words. That Jesus identified himself in these terms. Why does he choose these particular terms to identify himself to the church of Smyrna, since there are obviously other other details he could mention rather than these. Um, I'm not sure exactly why he chooses to mention that he's the first and the last at this point, but when he says, I was dead and now I'm alive, there seems to be a good pastoral reason for saying that, because he calls upon them in chapter 10 to be faithful unto death, and they will receive a crown of life, just as he did. And so we have a hint, both in verse 8 and in verse 10, that this church was facing very severe persecution, and that martyrdom was a real option, was a real possibility. Now, we don't read that they had any martyrs yet. In fact, the worst of their persecution apparently was yet to come. He says, fear none of those things that are going to come, that you're going to suffer. 
He says, the devil will cast some of you into prison. He doesn't mention execution, but uh, he does tell them to be faithful to death, so some of them apparently would have to be prepared for to be executed. But the devil would throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you'll have tribulation for ten days. Now, we often read in, uh, in Christian books about a seven-year tribulation, and while the Bible doesn't anywhere identify a period of tribulation as seven years, it does, in this place, identify a period of tribulation as, seven, uh, as ten days. In fact, this is the only place where any length of time is affixed to any period of tribulation. Tribulation is a fairly generic term in the Bible. Many of the epistles tell us that Christians should expect to be uh, faced with tribulation and to endure tribulation. Here they are told their tribulation will be ten days. Those who, those who understand these letters to be slices of church history identify the church of Smyrna with the church immediately after the age of the apostles. They say this represents the time from about 100 A.D. till about 303 A.D. And during that time, at least the teaching I sat under originally, said they, they were persecuted by ten emperors, and possibly the, having tribulation for ten days is a reference to these ten emperors. Now, I find it interesting that a dispensationalist would make this suggestion since the dispensationalists are the ones who say we have to be literal. And while it may be that the church was persecuted by ten emperors, that is not a literal interpretation of ten days. If we want to be literal in our ta time frames, then we'd have to say this church suffered for ten days and not a day longer, and not a day shorter. Uh, now, in, since I don't necessarily feel compelled to stick with a literal interpretation, especially of the numbers in the book of Revelation, I'm inclined to see ten days simply to refer to a time that is long enough to be annoying and troublesome, but short enough to be tolerable. I don't think any of us would choose to go to jail in a third world prison for ten days if we had the choice. If we, I mean, if someone said, would you like to spend the next ten days in jail or would you rather be at liberty? Obviously, we would find it unpleasant spending ten days in jail. Uh, we'd probably find it unpleasant spending one or two days in jail, but ten days, you know, would be particularly trying. But it is a short enough time that it still has a foreseeable end and that it's not necessarily the end of the world. It's something that we could, by the grace of God, be expected to endure. And so I think ten days simply means a short but possibly intense persecution was upon this church. The devil is said to put them in prison, but notice it is the people of the synagogue of Satan that are their tormentors. Or that sounds like they're the problem. He says, I know their, their, their blasphemy of those who say they're Jews, but they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. And this I understand to mean that the Jewish population of the city was giving problems to the church. Um, and since they were the agents of Satan, when he says the devil shall throw some of you in prison, it may be through the instigation of the Jews, the Jews there. Uh, we, again, we don't know the fulfillment of this. We don't have any rec you know, surviving history of the Church of Smyrna, but <coughs> we do know from the book of Acts that it was frequent that the Apostle Paul uh, was either thrown in jail or otherwise driven out of town or in some way persecuted because the Jews in town would instigate the Roman rulers against them and would try to stir them up against the Apostles. And on more than one occasion, the Apostles were thrown in jail because of this kind of stuff. So the same kind of thing apparently was going to happen in Smyrna if it was not already happening. And he says initially about this church in verse 9, as he says about all of them, I know your works. But he says, and your tribulation and poverty. But he says in parentheses, but you are rich. This is in contrast to what he says to the church of Laodicea. In fact, this letter is in many respects just the, the opposite of the church of Laodicea because the church of Laodicea is one of the churches that he has nothing good to say about. This church he has nothing bad to say about. And whereas the church of Laodicea was apparently comfortable and rich, Jesus said, I know, you know, you say, I am rich and have need of nothing, but he says, but you are really poor and wretched and naked and blind. So here's a church that is actually, physically speaking, in poverty, but he says, you're really rich, spiritually speaking. The Laodicean church was apparently prospering financially, but he says, you're really poor. You're, you're not in the condition you judge yourself to be in. Now, this makes it very clear that financial 
prosperity is not necessarily um, a mark of a person's faith or, or of God's favor upon them. It's clear that Jesus favored this church. He had nothing negative to say about this church. He just sent them a word of encouragement. And while they were in fact in poverty, probably because of uh, imposed boycotts against their businesses and so forth that the, the local Jews uh, were promoting, uh, yet they were rich as far as Jesus was concerned. He didn't suggest to them that their situation financially ought to be different. It says in James that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. And here is a church made up of Christians who were poor in this world, but rich in faith, as he points out to them. So he says, don't fear those things that are, you're about to suffer, in verse 10. Jesus, that's very typical of Jesus to say. He said to his disciples in the Gospels, don't fear those who can kill the body and can do no more. Just fear God. And so here also he, he tells them, don't fear those things that you're going to have to suffer. Uh, if you're just faithful to death, I'll give you the crown of life. And then he has the typical, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, followed by the promise to the overcomers, he that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, the second death has not yet been explained in the Bible prior to this. We really encounter it in chapter 20, where it says that those who participate in the first resurrection shall not be hurt by the second death. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, it talks about that. And then, at the end of Revelation 20, in verse 15, I believe it is, it says, and death and haze were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the se second death. So the lake of fire is the second death. Physical death being the first, eternal judgment being the second. Now, again, the choice of blessings that he pronounces or promises to the overcomers is suited to the need of the church. He's asked them to be faithful unto death, physical death. He's not promising them any deliverance from physical death. He's not promising them that they will escape persecution or even martyrdom. But he can promise them this. If they remain faithful unto death, they will be free from the second death. And that's more than can be said for their persecutors. Their persecutors may escape death or may live longer than they do in this world, but uh, they will never escape the second death. Uh, because they're, they're lost. So the encouragement to the church is when you're facing a, a death sentence for your faith, don't fear it because what really matters is whether you are subject to the second death or not. Everybody eventually dies physically. Everybody does, except that, that one generation of Christians that will be alive when Jesus returns. Some of them will not taste death. But uh, most Christians throughout history and most non-Christians throughout history have all died, and all non-Christians will. So that death, physical death, is not something to be avoided, especially not at the cost of compromise. I'm not saying it's wrong to avoid death if by that we mean you eat rather than starve, or you look both ways before you cross the street rather than blindly walking across a business. Obviously, there's certain certain ways in which we ought to prudently avoid uh, an irresponsible early death. But when the avoidance of death means compromising, denying the faith, or backing down on our principles, death should not be avoided. It's more important to avoid sin than to avoid death. Because if we successfully avoid sin, then we have nothing to fear from the second death. And it's always, it's a sad thing to think of people compromising so that they won't have to die when in fact they're going to die anyway. Everybody's going to die. Jesus said, he that seeks to save his life will lose it. But he that will lose his life for my sake and for the Gospels will, will find it to everlasting life. He said that to the disciples at Caesarea Philippi uh, in Matthew 16, for example, and in the parallels. <clears throat> in fact, Jesus said a very similar thing in the Gospel of John, too. Well, um, let's go on then to the next letter which is to the church of Pergamus, or Pergamum, I think the King James says. No, is it Pergamus there too? The, the same city is known both as Pergamus and Pergamum. Pergamum, uh, Pergamum in, in the modern translation? Or in, in NIV. So NIV, right. okay. Yeah, it's the King James then that uses the term Pergamus. Um, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamus write, These things saith he, I'm reading at the moment from the King James rather than my new King James, uh, saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. 
I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. And you hold fast my name and hold, have not denied my faith, even in those days in which Antipas was my faithful witness or my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there uh, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So you have also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto you quickly and I will fight against you, them, with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat the hidden of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except him that receives it. Okay, now the Pergamus, or Pergamum, was actually the provincial capital of, of Asia. Remember we're talking about Asia as the Roman province of Asia, rather than what we know as Asia. It's, we're not talking about a continent here, we're talking about a province which is roughly the same borders as modern Turkey. And of that province, the, the Roman capital was Pergamum, or Pergamus. It had a, a, a military unit uh, that operated out of there. It had an appointee of the emperor ruling there. Um, it was renowned for its buildings. It had a library that had over 200,000 volumes. Now, probably libraries with 200,000 volumes are not rare today, but we have printing presses today. When, when books had to be written by hand, 200,000 volumes would be a very expensive uh, library to, to have. And uh, it was known, you know, for, for having a much larger library than almost anywhere else in the world except for Alexandria, Egypt. Pergamus, or Pergamum, and Alexandria, I believe, had the two largest libraries in the world. Um, it also had the temple of Asclepius there. Asclepius was considered to be the god of healing. In fact, it is said that this town, this, this city was sort of the Lourdes of the ancient world. You've heard of Lourdes where uh, especially Catholic pilgrims go because there's healings that take place there. Uh, there's been, I guess, appearances of the Virgin there and so forth. And there's, it's a, the place in modern times and for a long time now has been associated with miraculous healings and such. And it is said that Pergamus had that reputation back in the ancient time when people had incurable diseases. They'd often go there. They had the temple there to Asclepius, the god of healing. And uh, so there was a lot of apparently occultic spiritual counterfeit activity going on there. Therefore, when Jesus says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's seat is, it's hard to know whether Satan's seat is really a reference to the Roman political seat that was there, or whether it's a reference to the demonic activity that went there associated with the healings uh, in the temple of Asclepius. It's not certain. Um, it was also the first city in Asia to erect a temple to Caesar Augustus. So emperor worship uh, had some of its early beginnings in this city. Another reason why it could be said that this city is where Satan's seat was. Uh, the place was really culturally an, a, a hostile environment to Christianity. Satan really had a foothold in many respects. There was political power, there was military power there, there was a temple to the emperor, there was a temple to Asclepius, there was demonic power manifested there, so much so that the whole world knew of it. The library, the presence of that library suggests there's probably a lot of intellectual um, interest in the city, uh, and of course the intellectuals would largely be not Christians, probably Greek and Latin uh, philosophers and so forth uh, had their disciples there, uh, where there's a good library they could access. In other words, the Christians, although they may have been a strong church, they were in a, a very hostile environment culturally. And Jesus acknowledges that apparently sympathetically. He says, I know where you dwell, you're, you're dwelling where Satan's seat is, and yet you've held fast to my faith and my name, and you've not denied my faith. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. <coughs> We don't know anything about Antipas except for this reference to him, but apparently he was a local Christian 
who in some way or another uh, fell out of favor with the authorities, possibly from preaching or whatever, and he was he was put to death. And yet the church was unshaken by this. They didn't deny the faith. Uh, now when Stephen, the first martyr, was killed in Jerusalem, it led to a general outbreak of persecution against the church. It was just once once the Jews tasted blood, they decided you know they wanted more of that, and that's what led eventually to the great persecution of which Saul of Tarsus was a, was a spearhead. Uh, perhaps when Antipas was killed in Pergamos, it may have it may have led to a general outbreak of persecution against the church, sort of the breaking of a dam of hostility that had been building up. And once there's a martyr, there's sort of a precedent set so that other Christians' lives are 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 in question or in danger and so forth. And if there was that kind of a thing, which is not unreasonable to suggest, then it is a particular uh, virtue on the part of the church that they did not deny the faith, even in that time when it was becoming very costly to hold to the faith. Now, he does say, I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. It says that Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. And they also have those who have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which Christ hates. We don't know very much of the specifics about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, but if it is correct that it is a form of antinomianism, then it would seem that it was very similar to what is here described as the doctrine of Balaam. Now, Balaam's activities um, are not featured very prominently in the, in, in, in the Old Testament. Most of what we read about Balaam in the book of Numbers is about how he sought to curse Israel, but was unable to do so. God did not permit him to do that. And so when, you know, when we think, well, what was the doctrine of Balaam? It, it doesn't sound like he did anything really bad. But later on, in an obscure reference in Numbers, it indicates that the children of Israel were stumbled by Balaam, that the Moabite women that were taken from Baal Peor, uh, Moses said these women, uh, through the counsel of Balaam, seduced our men. So apparently what Balaam had done was, because he was offered a wage to curse the children of Israel, and God supernaturally prevented him from doing so, he found a way of getting his wages after all. And that would be, he apparently said to Balak, listen, I, I can't curse these people, but if I know how you can get their own God to curse them, uh, just lead them into fornication, lead them into idolatry. That's the thing that will get God down on him, and uh, the counsel of Balaam to Balak was apparently along those lines. Balak, of course, was the king of Moab who had summoned uh, Balaam. I don't, I, I don't know why there's no cross-reference in this particular Bible I'm looking at to the place. I believe it's in Numbers 31 where this is mentioned. Does anyone have a cross-reference in their Bible? 31.16. 31, 16. 31, 16, okay. <clears throat> so, although the church had not denied the faith, there were some in the church who certainly had drifted from the faith. There were some who held to this doctrine of antinomianism that allowed people to go into idol temples, to participate at some level in idolatry, and to commit fornication. Now, these things are fairly intolerable. And I think that those who are doing those things are, are not included in the number they're said to have not denied Christ's name or his faith. These people apparently were denying the faith. And Jesus says... Repent or else I'll come unto you quickly and I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice, I'll come to you and fight against them. Now, it is impossible to believe that Jesus would actually wage war against his own people. Therefore, them, the ones who have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam, were, though they were in the church, Christ didn't consider them his own people. Every church is a mixture of true and, and false believers. And we're not necessarily in the position always to decide who's true and who's false, nor is that necessarily our duty. Although if a person who is not a true Christian becomes so blatant in their sin or in their heresy, the church does have an obligation to recognize that and to, and to discipline that situation. Now, I find it interesting that all of these churches, even the ones against whom Christ had a great deal, are still called churches. They still have lampstands in his presence, at least at the moment, at the time he's writing. And yet, churches like the church of Laodicea and Sardis, really he had nothing good to say about them, and they were no doubt in danger, very much grave danger, of ceasing to be churches at all. 
But even they had a few overcomers. Every church had people in whom Jesus saw at least potentially as overcomers, because even to the church of Laodicea, it says, to him that overcomes, I will give. And so apparently, wherever there are two or more true Christians, there is a church, even if a church has become predominantly apostate, or predominantly um, carnal, or, or in sin. It does not mean that everybody who's in that church is a true Christian. Jesus knows who his own are. But apparently a group has enough right to call itself a church if there's at least some true Christians in it, some overcomers. Although some of these groups that Jesus acknowledged to be churches seem to be fairly overrun with heresy and evil and, and so forth, and some were in grave danger of not being churches at all. That is, they were in danger of having their candlestick removed. In this case, he says, if you don't repent as a church of allowing this doctrine to go on, I'm going to come and I'm going to fight against these people with the sword out of my mouth. Now, he had identified himself in the opening of the letter, in verse 12, to him that has the sharp sword with two edges. That's part of the description of, uh, given in the vision of chapter 1. Exactly what it means that he will come and fight against that church with the sword out of his mouth is not clear. Um, presumably, the sword represents his word. And it is possible that it means that his, you know, he'll... You know, somehow by the ministry of his word in the church, there will be a separation. These people will be weeded out and they'll no longer be in the church. I don't know. When he says repent, what is the church to repent of? Um, the, the overcomers, the true believers, are not the ones that Jesus says he's going to fight against. He's going to come and fight against those who apparently are either not true believers or are so compromised as believers that they're in danger of coming under his wrath. Exactly the means of wrath, the means of execution is not clear because it is referred to as the sword that comes out of his mouth and that is no doubt a symbolic. But what does it mean to repent? What, what is this church actually called upon to do? Presumably Christ is upset with the church because they have tolerated this Nicolaitan heresy and this Balaam heresy. That they have tolerated sin in the church and have done nothing about it. Paul, when he wrote to the Corinthian church, which also had immorality and idolatry, in, in Corinth there were people eating meat sacrificed to idols and people living in fornication, the very, the very things that are mentioned here. And Christ had something against that church too, and he had Paul write to it. And Paul basically said, put that evil man out of the church. Don't you judge those who are in the church? Don't you know a little leaven leavens a whole lump? And so in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he actually tells them to eliminate from the church the offending parties. And that's apparently what the Church of Pergamon was obligated to do too, to repent of having tolerated this. And the marks of their repentance would be apparently to discipline those members and put them out. If, they, if the Church doesn't do it, Jesus will in some form take action himself against them. The form in which he will do so is not all, all that clear. But the threat is intended to be frightening. That he will come and fight against them with the sword out of his mouth. The Roman sword, as I mentioned, was fairly um, was seated in Pergamos. It was the it was the seat of imperial authority in that province, and you know one of the major things that might have led to compromise was fear of the Roman sword. Whereas the people of Smyrna, uh, well, no, don't even have to look at the people of Smyrna. In Pergamos, there had already been persecution. There had been Antipas who probably who had died. Probably by the Roman sword. We don't know that to be the case, but we don't know it not to be the case. There's no mention of Jews in this particular letter being the persecutors. The, the death of Antipas probably was at the hands of the Romans. And since that was the imperial seat of the province, it's, it's not too hard to imagine that Antipas had fallen out of favor with the authorities. He probably had to stand before a Roman court and was probably executed by a Roman sword. Or maybe even crucified since Romans did that too. But the point here is, there's another sword the church should be far more concerned about. Not just the sword that, that killed Antipas. There is a church, there are, there are some in the church who have remained faithful, even through that. But there are some who are, you know, though they may not be fearing the Roman sword, or they may even, they should be fearing the sword that, of, of judgment from Jesus. And that's what he tells them. Uh, his sword is something they ought to be aware of. And he says, he that has an ear, let him hear, verse 17, what the Spirit says to the churches. Let him, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, 
except him that receives it. Now, there's two promises here, or maybe three. One is that they'll eat the hidden manna if they're overcomers, and the other is that they'll receive a white stone with a name on it, their name. Presumably, maybe not their name, maybe it's his name. It's hard to say. It's a name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, why does he mention this particular promise? I think it has to do with the fact that since there were those who were tempting them to eat at the Feast of Idol Temples, to eat meat sacrificed to idols, he's saying, listen, don't eat at the idol temples. I have a feast for you far better than that. If you overcome this temptation, if you remain pure, if you abstain from participating in the Feast of the Idols, I'll give you a feast of a different sort. I'll let you eat the hidden manna. Now, the reference to the hidden manna probably refers to the manna that was put in the Ark of the Covenant, hidden in a golden pot there. And as you probably remember, there was a tradition among the Jews that Jeremiah would appear near the end of the, uh, uh, well, at the beginning of the Messianic age, and would bring out the manna out of the golden pot and would uh, distribute it and feed the people and have a great Messianic feast. Now, Jesus is not here confirming that, that tradition to be true, but his wording suggests that if you avoid the idol's feast, you'll participate in the Messianic feast. After all, Jesus, in talking about the manna in John chapter 6, had said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven, and my body is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And he is the manna, really. So he's saying, you've got a choice. You can participate in these idols feasts, in which case you deprive yourself of any right to eat of the, of the spiritual manna in the feast of God. Or else you can abstain from idolatry and have the right to eat at a, at a better feast than that. I'll give you the hidden manna. And as far as the white stone is concerned, uh, there's quite a difference of opinion as to what that represents. On the one hand, many commentators believe that it refers to a stone that would serve sort of as a key to the city or, or as a, almost like a backstage pass. Uh, it would be a pass to special functions, possibly to government um, sponsored plays and, and sports events or whatever that, that people could enter if they had, if they could show that they had one of these passes, which was a white stone. Um, possibly a pass to the idol's feasts, that if you wanted to participate in the feast, you had to show your, your stone at the door. Apparently there were customs like this. I don't know where this knowledge derives from, but there are commentaries who have mentioned that, as, that it was customary to use a, a white stone as a, as a token of admission into certain functions. And so he might be saying simply, I'll give you the white stone that admits you into my feast if you abstain from going into the idol's feast. Another suggestion that has been made is that uh, the, in the Olympic Games, when a runner won the race, he was given initially a white stone, which was a token that he would later trade for his crown. That rather than crowning him as soon as he came to the finish line, the, the winner of each event would be given a white stone, and at the end of all the events, then they would come with their white stones to show that they, in fact, were the winner, and then they'd be crowned with the wreath that they were really seeking. And some have felt like that's what Jesus is alluding to, that if you run the race, and you don't give up, and you overcome, and you win, I'll give you a white stone, later to be traded in for a crown. That's also a possible meaning. A third suggestion that's been made is that in the Roman courts, and I, again, I don't know how much of this you know, is demonstrable from outside extra-biblical sources, and how much of it is the conjecture of the commentators. You know, I've, I've read a lot of commentators, all different ideas. But they all suggest that there's some custom back there that this alludes to, and whether they have external proof of that custom or not, I'm afraid they often haven't said what their sources are. But there is the suggestion that in the Roman courts, when a man stood before the judge, if the judge handed him a black stone, it was passing down a sentence of condemnation. But if he was vindicated, he was handed a white stone by the judge. And that the white, receiving of a white stone was basically a pardon, was basically uh, a justification, being vindicated, being able to walk away free and have no one accuse you because the judge had vindicated you. And some feel that that's the custom that's referred to here, which is a possibility in this particular case because the Roman court, you know, there would be a very important Roman legal system uh, centered out of Pergamus, and it's possible that Antipas had been handed a black stone by the judge, and he was put to death. 
And Jesus would be saying, listen, if you're faithful, you know, the Roman courts may give you a black stone, but I'll give you a white stone. As far as in my book, you'll be innocent. In my book, you'll be justified, uh, regardless of what the Romans decide against you. So all of these suggestions have been made. All of them have some allure. They, they all have some um, attraction. I don't know which is the correct interpretation or even if any of them are, but those are some suggestions to chew on. Um, the fourth letter then is to the church of Thyatira. Let's look at that in verse 18. Uh, this church, I believe, re receives the longest letter of the seven. It says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works. He's already mentioned those. He mentions them again, the works. And the last to be more than the first. So their works have become more numerous as time has gone on, not less. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you permit that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things, sacrifice idols. The same two things that were a problem in Pergamos. But in Pergamos, he calls it the doctrine of Balaam, which may suggest that it was a doctrine that was being taught by some male leadership in Pergamos. Here it is apparently a woman, a false prophetess in, in this church, is teaching the same kind of antinomianism. This, these were the great temptations for early Gentile Christians. Idolatry was prominent in the entire Roman world. Every city had its, had its shrines and temples where feasts to idols were, con, uh, were conducted. Uh, some of the great social events were conducted as feasts uh, dedicated to certain idols. And once a person was converted out of that culture, he was being asked to give up a, a major part of the social life. Uh, it's like giving up all parties or something. You know, I mean, it's, uh, for a modern person who, who, who goes to parties a lot when he gets saved, he may find the parties inappropriate places for him to, to hang around. And fornication, likewise, was often a part of idol worship. It was Some of the cities actually had temple prostitutes in them, so that pr prostitution and sex were a part of the worshiping of idols. And even where, the, you know, that was not the only use of fornication. Fornication was just a very a way of life for pagans, even as it's becoming in our own paganized culture. It's only in cultures that have been deeply affected by the Bible, either Jewish culture or, or, or in cultures affected by Christianity, where fornication is really frowned upon. Uh, and in fact, if we have any negative things about fornication in our minds, it's probably just because of the influence of Christianity upon us. But cultures that had not been Christianized, and at this point the Roman Empire had not been, were very, you know, didn't didn't have any particular stigma attached to fornication, and people had the same number of desires and temptations then as now, but they just had no reason not to do it. So when a person became a Christian, fornication and participation in idol feasts were probably the two great temptations that the world uh, offered to them, but which they had given up out of their former lifestyles. And so we find in Pergamos and also in Thyatira and possibly even in Ephesus, since there were the deeds of the Nicolaitans there, there may have been this, this was the great thing that was a struggle for the Christians to avoid. In Thyatira, though, it was a woman who was teaching these things. Verse 21, and I, he says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, but she didn't repent. And I will cast her, behold, I will cast her into a bed. Actually, in the Greek, it's, it's, a, it's a bed of distress or a sick bed. Um, a bed of agony. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, those who aren't following Jezebel, and which have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you already have, hold fast till I come. And he that overcomes and keeps my words unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I receive from my father. And I will give him the morning star. 
He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. <coughs> now here, Thyatira is a city about which there's not too much to be said. It was, it's known to have been a city that had a number of trade guilds centered in it. And a lot of those trade guilds were probably related to the making of idols. We know, for instance, that Paul encountered problems from the trade guild in in Ephesus, which was uh, metal workers who made a lot of their living from making metal images for idolatrous practices. There probably were those kinds of trade guilds in uh, Thyatira also. But, but even if it was not those kinds of trades, most of the Christians probably were employed in some kind of a trade and part of a guild. And many of the guilds uh, included... Um, invocations and prayers to idols as part of their regular meetings as together and so forth and Christians would be in a hard position if they didn't participate in these things it'd be it'd be like if you were a, a, an employed in a company and they, they had a, an annual Christmas party and all the employees were kind of expected to participate but you know that what's going to happen there is a whole bunch of fornication and a lot of drunkenness and, and uh, blasphemous jokes and things like that. It's just the kind of thing that you don't really think it would be a good witness for you to participate in or pleasing to God. And yet, you know that your job may be at stake if you make yourself aloof. If not your job, at least your popularity among your fellow workers that you have to deal with on a day-by-day -day basis. And you'd be under sort of a pressure here. Apparently... Uh, it can be deduced, probable, that the Christians in Thyatira, many of them probably were associated with some of these trade guilds that were so big there. I mean, the church was no doubt just a cross-section of converts from society, and many, probably a huge percentage of the people in society made their living in some kind of a trade that, that would inquire, require them to be part of a guild. And that means uh, that they would be faced with, you know, <laughs> occupational hazards like idolatry and fornication at their at their guild meetings and so forth. Now, some of them might have even been in the position to have to choose between their job and their and their faith. And that's a hard choice for some people to make. And so there arose in the church apparently a prophetess who, professing to speak the deep things of God, but Jesus says they're really the deep things of Satan. Uh, she said it's okay. Don't feel so pressured. Just do it. You know, it's okay to eat things sacrificed to idols. It's okay to commit fornication. Now, the, the, the amazing thing is that a lot of times people who promote antinomianism do profess to be teaching deeper truths, you know, a more esoteric, uh, uh, higher understanding of what grace means. Uh, it's an amazing thing. The people in Corinth apparently had this problem, too, because Paul said when they tolerated the man who was living in sin with his father's wife, he said, and you're proud of yourselves, as if that's some kind of a commendable thing, that you have some kind of a superior grasp of grace because you allow these things to happen. He says, that's not superior. That's inferior. He says, you ought to be mourning and weeping instead, and this person should be kicked out of the church. Um, that's one of the ploys of Satan. When he tries to get Christians to do things that are immoral, he often does so by convincing them that it's more spiritual to be immoral because it shows that you understand grace better. There's a, there's a modern teacher, I believe he's still alive today, uh, R.B. Thiem is his name. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. Uh, he's out of Texas. He's a military officer, once was, probably retired, I imagine. But he's a guy who who has what I would consider to be sort of a cultic following. He's professing to be a Christian. In fact, I guess he's recognized as a Christian by most Christians. Uh, Hal Lindsey, in his recent book called The Road to Holocaust, actually dedicated the book to R.B. Thiem, who he called his spiritual father. I didn't realize that Hal Lindsey had a connection to R.B. Thiem. Apparently, R.B. Thiem led him to the Lord or something, or discipled him in his youth, which might explain some of Hal Lindsey's problems. But most of the followers of R.B. Thiem that I've known and I don't say how Lindsay does this, but uh, but I've met many followers of RB theme uh, in many different cities, and they almost all smoke and drink and party and blaspheme and swear. I mean, it's almost like they go out of their way to be carnal. And one of the teachings of RB theme, and he believes that he's the only one who really teaches this really in its pure form, is is a concept he calls super grace. He's got his own terminology for certain things that he teaches, and one of his terms is super grace. And the idea apparently is, when you really understand the grace of God, you realize that 
Nothing you do matters. Therefore, if you try to live a holy life or you avoid sin, you're just showing that you don't understand grace yet. This is identical to ancient antinomianism. It's the exact same teaching. And the amazing thing is persons who teach this and hold to it often think they're the ones who are spiritually superior. They have grasped this concept. And uh, the rest of the church is groveling down in the legalism of thinking that it matters how you live. And uh, this is an amazing thing, that people would fall to this, I mean, who are true Christians. Most true Christians don't stay in it. Danny Lehman, when he first got saved, actually studied in a, in a group in Santa Cruz that was uh, followers of RB theme, but he got out of it shortly after because he was a true Christian. <laughs> uh, and I'm not saying every true Christian will get out of it, but I don't know how a true Christian could stay in it, because basically it's antinomianism. And I'm not saying that RB theme encourages people to swear or smoke, although I've heard him swear on tapes that he's preached. But uh, it's almost like they go out of the way to show that they're not caught up into any kind of religious legalism, you know. They almost like to maybe shock people with their, with their sins, you know, say, well, that's because I understand being saved by grace, not by works. Um, well, obviously, what we should say is they misunderstand what grace is. They certainly aren't teaching the same doctrine of grace that, that Paul taught, although they think they are. They think they're the, the most enlightened followers of Paul's doctrine. Well... It's, uh, that appears to have been happening in Thyatira. Because this woman who called herself a prophetess was teaching that it's okay to commit fornication and meet sacrifice idols. And apparently she was calling these things the deep things of God. The reason I say that is because Jesus sarcastically refers to those, that doctrine as the deep things of Satan in verse 24. It says, as they call them. Of course, Jezebel wasn't saying, these are the deep things of Satan. She was probably saying they're the deep things of God, but Jesus says, as they call them, the deep things. But they're really the deep things of Satan. And those who have known and followed this doctrine are going to be suffer the same fate as this woman. Now, I doubt that Jezebel is the literal name of this woman. It's, it's interesting that the thing that she's teaching is basically parallel to what Jezebel in the Old Testament did in Israel. It was Jezebel that reintroduced Baal worship into the culture of Israel. And uh, while there's no emphasis in the Old Testament about her immorality, um, there are hints that she was a, um, a woman who was immoral, and certainly Baal worship itself brought immorality in with it. And so what we probably have is a woman whose name is being not mentioned, who was recognized by some in the church as a prophetess, who was teaching antinomianism, and because the effect she was having on the church is similar to that which Jezebel had on the people of God in Israel in her time, this woman is symbolically given the name Jezebel. Um, it's unlikely that anyone would name their child Jezebel any time after the historic Jezebel had been around. Now, when Jesus introduces himself to this church in verse 18, he says, He's the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and has feet like fine brass. His eyes, his penetrating gaze can see right through the hypocrisy of these people, and his feet like brass are capable and in, and and inclined to bring judgment, to trample them as grapes in the wrath in the vineyard or in the wine press of the wrath of God. And so, although he says some good things about the church in general, the thing he has against the church is that they permit this woman Jezebel to teach and seduce God's servants. Again, not everybody in the church was followers of Jezebel. But they tolerated her, and that's something that Jesus doesn't want done. I remember um, once uh, in the uh, mid-70s, I was asked to be the youth pastor at a church that was a charismatic Baptist church. And they didn't have a youth pastor, and uh, someone from there had come to a home meeting I was leading and thought it would be neat if I could lead their youth. And so they, they asked me to come on their staff, and I prayed about it, and I, you know, I wasn't ministering full-time before that, so I'd, I welcomed an opportunity to have a full-time ministry. <laughs> and no sooner had I come there, but the pastor, who had recently come back from 11 years on the mission field, was given a four-week vacation, or a four-week sabbatical or something. And the Board of Deacons voted to have me preach in the pulpit in the four weeks he was gone, even though I had just arrived. They hardly knew me. But uh, they hardly knew the pastor either. He had just returned from the mission field. So I guess um, they had him, he, he took a break for four weeks away, and I preached for four weeks. Anyway, shortly after I came, some of the older people in the church, even one of the deacons, warned me about this particular woman in the church who was the choir director. She was the music leader. 
They said, uh, watch out for her, she seduces men. <laughs> and even now she's having an affair with a married uh, Sunday school teacher in this in church. And I, I was shocked, you know, that this thing was known and she was still tolerated ministering in the church. She had apparently seduced a number of men uh, over, over a period of time and that she had a not very well concealed affair going on at that very moment with a guy who was the uh, high school Sunday school teacher. Uh, and he was a married man with children. And... Uh, and and I was amazed. I remember the first Sunday I preached there. I was asking God what my text should be, and and this particular passage uh, came up. You know, you 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 allow this woman Jezebel to preach and or whatever teach. And I I actually preached on it, and she was in the audience, and uh, and I think she was pretty uncomfortable because I I didn't name her, although I could have. I was a newcomer there. I didn't feel like I wanted to press my life too much, but I said that <laughs> I said you know. This church has a lot of good things about it, but the, I think Jesus has something against it because uh, there's toleration of sin. There's toleration of of immorality in, among those who are even in the ministry here, uh, like this Jezebel. And uh, there's there are other there are other a lot of churches nowadays that are like this has has come to light in recent times. A lot of religious leaders have been exposed uh, for being immoral and so forth. He says, I gave her space to repent in verse 21 of her fornication, but she didn't repent. This is the generosity of Christ, that here he doesn't just judge immediately, even though she's doing things that are abominable. He gives her space to repent, but she doesn't take advantage of it. And that's, I think, what, what usually happens. I don't believe that as soon as you sin as a Christian, you lose your salvation and Jesus just gives up on you and throws you away. He gives you space to repent. He gives you a while. He brings conviction. He gives you opportunity. It may be long or short space. He doesn't owe any. <laughs> he doesn't owe you any space. If you'd sinned and he struck you dead that moment, he'd be quite within his rights. But out of his mercy, he gives time. It may be a short or a long time, but however long it is, you'd better take advantage of it. Uh, if you sin and Jesus doesn't judge immediately, don't wait for judgment to come and then repent. He's given you space to repent so that you don't have to fall into judgment. He gave her space, but she didn't take advantage of it. She didn't repent. And so he says he's going to cast her into a bed and all those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, as I said, you know, there are those who think that this is all a reference to different periods of church history. Those who think that way believe that the church of Pergamos was the imperial church flirting with the world, and that the church of Thyatira was the actual uh, papal church during the Dark Ages. There was a great deal of immorality in high places in the papal church, and anyone who reads the history uh, knows that to be true. There was actually a period during the Dark Ages of, a, of a several generations long called the Reign of the Harlots, where virtually all the popes were were involved in, you know, immoral stuff. Uh, one, w one pope was actually a woman disguised as a man, as it turns out, there were some popes involved in homosexual relationships. Now, this is not a slur just on the Catholic Church. There's a lot of Protestant leaders who are involved in these things, too, but it's just a fact of history. During a certain period of time, there was a tremendous amount of immorality among some of the popes. One pope was actually killed when uh, a woman's husband found her in bed with the pope, and uh, the husband killed her, killed the pope. Uh, it's a really a, a, a terrible period of history. And so some feel like they find some parallels between the Church of Thyatira and the Papal Church. But while you can find these exact parallels, the trouble with that theory is you can find parallels at any time in church history with that. There have always been immoral leaders in the churches. And uh, this, this idea of trying to identify these seven churches with seven periods of church history is a little artificial because they'll take some characteristic of that church and say, well, that characteristic was in the church during this period of time. But really... Whether we look at the persecuted church of Smyrna and say, well, the church was persecuted from the years 100 AD to, to, to 300 AD, that's true. But at what point in time has there not been persecution against some churches somewhere? You know, I mean, the church has been persecuted for its entire history. So to find that parallel between that church and that portion of history is a little artificial because you can find the same parallel with almost any church or the compromise of the church of Pergamos or the immorality of the church of Thyatira you'll find some churches at any given time in history that are like that. Um, he threatens to kill her and her children with death in verse 23. Um, but he speaks then to the church in verse 24 as a whole. And he says, unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, apparently the overcomers, 
as many as have not known this doctrine and have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I will put upon you no other burden. So the church in general is doing pretty good. He says, I know your works, your, your later works are actually more in number than your first works. You're really doing well in that respect. I really don't have anything against you except this one thing. I won't put any other burden on you except this one thing. And that is, I don't want you to tolerate this woman anymore. Get her out and her followers out of the church. But that which I, you already have, hold fast till I come. And he that overcomes and keeps my works to the end, I will give him power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall be, they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. Now that statement, even as I received of my father, means that my father has given me this privilege, and we read of that privilege in uh, Psalm chapter 2, verses 8 uh, and 9, where God says to Jesus, Ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the world for your inheritance, and you shall break them in pe you shall rule them with a rod of iron, you shall break them in pieces as a potter's vessel. This very language that he's using here, is promised to Jesus by his Father in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9. And so he says, Whoever overcomes, I will allow them to reign with me, even as my Father has given me this privilege, I will give you the privilege you'll share with me, you'll reign with me if you overcome now. Yes, Eric? Is this the, is this a direct quote? It is uh, not a direct quote. Okay. I mean, he's, it's, there are actually no direct quotes from the Old Testament in the book of Revelation, but... It is so close. I mean, it is so close that no one could miss the uh, the origins of this statement as coming from Psalm 2. Then, of course, he says, I will give them him the morning star. It's an interesting thought. Uh, later on, Jesus is identified as the morning star. In chapter 22 and verse 16, he says, I am the bright, the morning star. So what is meant by giving the, the believer the morning star? Give him myself. I suppose that's, I suppose that could be what he means. We do know that Peter said in 2 Peter 1.19 that the day is going to dawn and the morning star is going to rise in our hearts. So I've understood that to refer to Christ's own likeness, Christ's own image uh, coming forth in us as believers. And that might be what he's referring to there. He says, I'll give him the morning star. It's it's uncertain. I mean, simply because Jesus is simply is called the Morning Star elsewhere in the Book of Revelation. It's not certain why he uses this language. I'll give him the Morning Star. Either it means I'll give him myself, or I will. He may be referring to this this uh, likeness to Christ uh, coming forth in the believer. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's go on to the Church of Sardis. We obviously will not be able to finish all these, but. We can, we can move a little further. We have a little time left. We started late. Well, we're a little late. <coughs> Under the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you live, but you're dead. This is actually the only good thing he has to say about the church. The only thing they have good about him is their name. Um, they have a good name, but it's undeserved. They have a name for being a revival church. But they're really a dead church, by the way, Jesus equates or evaluates things. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. There's always a few, a small remnant in each church, even the worst of them. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcomes, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will bl not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is a fairly short letter. Sardis was the old capital of a country that had been called Lydia. Um... It was famous for the production of red dye and also for woolen goods. That was the main industry of Sardis, was the production of red dye and woolen goods. That may be why he makes reference to the overcomers walking before him in white garments. Since the town was famous for its red garments, 
He says, my people are going to be different. They'll walk in white garments. They're not going to have stains. Remember in Isaiah chapter 118, it says, though your sins be as crimson, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like scarlet, they shall be as snow. Um, sin, the stain of sin on people is likened to a red stain. Red was a color fast dye. Uh, and once it was in, you couldn't wash it out. And therefore, Isaiah uses that imagery of sin. Sin can't be washed away, but he says, come and let us reason together. Though your sins be like that, I'll still make them white. Even though it's humanly impossible to remove the red, I can do it. And so also here, in a town that was famous for its red dye and its red red clothing, uh, sort of like Rajneeshpuram, uh, he would have a few who would walk in white before him, whose, whose garments were clean. Um... One of the interesting things about the history of this city is that twice in its history, it had fallen to conquerors simply because someone had fallen asleep on the watch. It was a failure to watch that caused this city to fall easily to Cyrus in 549 B.C. Cyrus in 549 B.C. And then again, in 218 B.C., this city fell for the same reason, to Antiochus the Great, not to be confused with Antiochus Epiphanes, a previous Antiochus. Um, so Jesus interestingly says, tells them, watch. If you don't watch, I'll come on you as a thief. The city had fallen to its enemies twice in history for its failure to watch. And so Jesus says to the church, if you fail to watch, I will be like an enemy to you. Now, watching in this case meant to remain spiritually alert, to remain spiritually alive. And uh, they were not alive. They were dead. They had a name for being alive. They apparently had a full calendar of programs and, and events. They probably had youth camp and uh, you know Thursday night basketball games in the church gymnasium and uh, you know, all kinds of cell groups and midweek meetings and all kinds of things. That's usually how a church is considered to be alive is by its activities, by its by its programs that it has going. You know, it has a, a recovery group for alcoholics. It's got a recovery group for uh, victims of divorce, a recovery group for victims of uh, ch child abuse. It's got a recovery group for Vietnam vets or whatever. You know, I mean, it's got all these recovery groups. That's the mark of a live church by today's way of evaluating things. And I'm not saying those aren't good things for churches to concern themselves with. But the problem is you can do all those things, just like the church of Ephesus, have many works and yet have left first love. And it's possible for a church to be extremely active and have a full calendar, but have no, no actual life. And this is the first of the seven churches to which Jesus has nothing positive to say about them, unless it be you have a few people there who have not defiled themselves. But that in itself is true of any church. There's Any church that's worthy to be called a church has at least two or three believers in it, you know. Um, but if that's the most that can be said about a church, if everything else is negative, if Jesus can't think of anything else to commend, the church is in serious trouble. Now he promises to the overcomers that they'll be clothed in white raiment, and he says in verse 5, I will not blot out that person's name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Now, the book of life is mentioned later. At the end of Revelation 20, at the judgment, it says, those whose names were not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. So the book of life must be the book of, that contains the names of those who are saved. Jesus said to his disciples, the 70, when they came back from casting out demons in Acts chapter 10, uh, Luke chapter 10, excuse me, uh, in Luke 10, when they came back to the Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He made some comments, and then he said, however, in this, do not rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but that your names are written in heaven. Daniel was told in Daniel chapter 12, In that day all of your people shall be delivered whose names are written in the book. There is a book, figuratively speaking, I don't think God really needs actual books to remember what names are there. God's got a photographic memory, so he doesn't have to check the books. But uh, again, it's a figure. Uh, it's, a, it's a symbol, but we see the books being opened on the Day of Judgment, as if to read from them uh, the lives of the people that are standing under judgment. And there is a book called the Book of Life. It apparently contains the name of the people who are saved. Now, this particular statement, he that overcomes, I will not blot his name out of the Book of Life, by a very strong implication, suggests that if you don't overcome, your name will be blotted out of the Book of Life. Now, 
Uh, Calvinists have, have worked very hard to not, not allow that implication to be suggested. They say, well, it doesn't say that anyone's name ever will be blotted out of the book of life. It just says that if you're an overcomer, your name won't be. And that does not necessarily imply that your name would be otherwise. Well, then what's the point of the promise? If a Christian is a person whose name, by definition, will never be blotted out of the book of life, whether they do well or not, whether they overcome or not, then why make the promise? It's an empty promise. I mean, uh, I think... It also makes it clear that some people may have their name in the book of life at one time and have it blotted out at another time. See, this is the main point where Calvinism would be, would, would struggle to explain this particular verse because if it just says, whoever overcomes, I will have his name in the book of life, that wouldn't be a problem to the Calvinists, uh, nor to the Arminian for that matter. But it says, that person, I will not blot his name out. Well, the name can't be blotted out unless it's already been in. And the suggestion that this name that is in the book can be blotted out suggests that it's possible to be included among those who are saved at one point and later removed from that group. Now, some have thought the book of life may not refer to the book of those who are saved, but just the book of those who are alive, physically alive. And therefore, saying I won't blot your name out of the book of life means I won't kill you, you know. And I suppose that would be possible, except that the use of the book of life in, in chapter 20 seems to suggest that those who are excluded from the book of life go to the lake of fire. And only those who are in the book of life are saved. So it seems to be more than physical life and physical death. Others have suggested maybe at birth, everybody's name is in the book of life. After all, if children die uh, in infancy, most of us hope and trust that they will be saved. And that people are essentially born at infancy, innocent, ignorant, and therefore their names are in the book of life. But as they reach maturity, uh, or as they reach a, uh, an age of accountability, if they make the wrong moral choices, their name can be removed from the book of life. And virtually everybody's name is. After they reach moral accountability and start sinning uh, willfully, which everybody does at a certain point, then their name is removed. But initially all their names are in, but their names get removed. Uh, <coughs> But the problem here is not, it's not talking to infants. You know, it's not talking to little infants whose names are in the book and saying, okay now you little guys, if you, when you get older, if you overcome it, if you don't sin, your name won't be blotted out of the book of life. That's not the, the audience. The audience is adults who presumably had a sinful past already and then were converted and become Christians and their names are in the book of life and now what they have to be careful about is that their lives don't get blotted out of it. And those who overcome have the assurance that their names will not be blotted out. Yes, ma'am. I'm just saying my language is in Psalms 69, 28, and it's not, it doesn't seem to be anyway talking about those who were once saved. But... Read that. I, I only have the book of Revelation here. I don't have the whole Bible with me. I left it in the car by accident. Okay, so Psalm 16, 9, 28. 28. Okay, yeah. go ahead and read that. Just in practice. Yeah. Uh-huh. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Okay. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be in, what, included with the righteous or something like that? Written. Written with the righteous. Now, see, there, the book of the living certainly sounds like it means people who are physically alive. Yeah. Because what he's praying for is probably their death. Um, pardon? Someone had, if you look at the parallelism, then mm-hmm. it seems that the book of the living is the same as the writing, written of the righteous because the parallel right. of poetry. Right. So yeah. Saul, too. Yeah, you know, the, the, the thing is that he may be just uh, assuming that ultimately God will judge wicked people and preserve righteous people in terms of physical fate because, I mean, sometimes the psalm has, the psalmist has that general idea. God will deliver me from my enemies because I'm righteous and those wicked people are going to be killed and so forth. Um, yeah, I would say that the passage is not all that clear, whether it's referring to people who are, um, whether that's eternal life or physical life. I could see that either way. But uh, as Caleb points out, it is making a distinction between the, not just people who are alive and dead, but between who are, those who are righteous in the sight of God and those who are not. Which, whether David had or the writer had this view in mind or not, we know that the righteous are the ones who are saved. Um, so, you know, people can see that different ways. But I think that in, in, in Revelation 20, where it says, All whose names were not written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20 uh, and verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Shows that at the judgment, 
those who are in the book of life are saved and those who are not in the book of life are, are lost. Um, again, one could ask whether the book of the living mentioned in the Psalms is the same thing as the book of life in, in the Revelation. It sounds like it, but it's not exactly the same term, so it might, there might be a different nuance intended. Okay, let's, uh, we started a few minutes late, we're going to end a few minutes late for that reason. Let's go on to the church of Philadelphia. Verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works, behold, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet, to know that I have loved you, because you have kept the word of my patience, or the King James says, my command to endure, or something like that. Uh, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them who dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which you have, that no man take your crown. He that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Philadelphia was uh, a city that had known a great number of earthquakes. It was entirely destroyed by an earthquake in 17 A.D., but apparently there were a lot of earthquakes in that area. And as a result, many people were afraid to live in the city. It's sort of like California. Um, there's some people who would never live in California. Some people aren't bothered by earthquakes uh, happening. I was raised in California, so I never was really too concerned about earthquakes, though I've lived through many of them. Um, I, we had Once I had a school in California, and, and a, a group of eight people came out in a bus. They bought a bus and drove it out from Massachusetts to go through the school. And uh, one of the girls was particularly uh, scared about coming to California because she'd heard about all the earthquakes there. And, and we said, ah, oh, we don't have earthquakes here very much. You know, it's no big deal. You'll probably, you know, it was a three-month school. We said, you'll probably never even have one. And within the first two or three weeks of the school, there was a major earthquake. So she got, the thing she greatly feared came upon her. But uh, there are people who, you know, when they think of California, they think, oh, I wouldn't go within, you know, 100 miles of that place, so all those earthquakes. Well, Philadelphia had a reputation like that, too. That city was was apparently on a fault line or something because it, it, it had a lot of earthquake damage. And there were people who, they'd go out when there were earthquakes and wait until the coast was clear and go back in. And some would never go back in. When he says, you shall go no more out, I'll make you a temple and a, a, a pillar in the temple of our God. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Uh, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God and you will go no more out. It might be an illusion to the fact that the people in Philadelphia were always insecure. Would they have to go out of the city again? He says, well, listen, if you're an overcomer, I'll write on you the name of the city of my God, and you'll never have to go out of there. You know, uh, The idea is it, it's an unshakable kingdom. It's an unshakable city, and nothing will scare you out of there. Nothing will, you know, if you're an overcomer, you'll have a, an abiding place there. Now, this church also, according to verse 9, was bothered by Jews, it would appear. There must have been a, a powerful Jewish population that persecuted the church, this one and Smyrna, the only two churches against which nothing is said. That is, there's no complaint that Jesus makes against this church. They were also the two churches that had Jewish uh, opposition against themselves. Um, the church was a small church, probably because of the earthquakes, the population of the town was not very large. And uh, therefore they had what he called a little strength. But he spoke very encouragingly to them that he would keep them safe. Uh, he described himself as him that has the key of David in verse 7. He that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. Now you probably recognize that that is a, a saying that comes from Isaiah chapter 22. Remember how I said that the book of Revelation rebirths images from the Old Testament but doesn't necessarily use them exactly the same way. This idea of having the key of David and opening so that no man shuts and shutting so that no man opens is taken directly from the 22nd chapter of Isaiah where these things are said about a man named Eliakim. 
Now, Jesus is not trying to say that Eliakim was a type of Christ or that Jesus is Eliakim or anything like that. It's just saying that Eliakim had a, a kind of authority in the house of David. He was given the key. He could open the chambers or close the chambers. And when he opened them, no one could shut them because he had the ultimate authority about those things. He carried the keys. He was a trusted official in the house of David, which at the time was Hezekiah's house. Uh, Hezekiah, the Davidic king at the time. Now, he could open doors of access to the king or to the king's chambers or keep them closed, and his decision was final. If he opened it, no one had the right to shut it. If he shut it, no one had the right to open it. He was the man who had that ultimate final say. And Jesus says, you know, I have that same authority in the real kingdom of David, in the kingdom of God, in the house of God. Access to God is my decision. I can open or shut as I please, and if I open, no one can shut. Now, the probability here is that the Jews who were persecuting the church in that town were excluding them, or at least making them feel rejected, and saying, God doesn't, you know, God doesn't accept you people. Uh, but Jesus was saying, listen, I'm the one who makes that decision. They can't shut the door on your relationship with God. If I open it, it's open, and no one can shut it. However, if I shut it, no one can open it. And therefore, the only person you have to please is me and not these people. Now, when he says, I've set before you an open door, some people have understood this to refer to the door of opportunity. In fact, those who understand these to be phases of church history have referred to this as the evangelical church. And they think it represents the church from 1700 A.D., starting with the Wesleys and, and other revival movements, and going on up till about the middle of this century, till about 1950 A.D., and they say that this is the church that had an open door of evangelism, of missions, and so forth. Now, it's true that the Apostle Paul, in a few of the places that he wrote, did refer to opportunities that were his as open doors. He says, an open door has, a door has been opened to me to minister. Um, however, that doesn't seem to be what an open door here means. Because in mentioning the open door, it's in the same context of having the key to the house of David and opening and no man shuts and so forth. He's not talking about a door of opportunity in missions to this church. He's talking about the door of the house uh, of David or into the, into the kingdom, as it were. So he's basically opened the way of the kingdom for them and no one can exclude them if he's opened it to them. And that's what he's saying in this remark. He mentions that the Jews uh, that are now opposing them will someday have to eat their words. They'll have to bow at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you um, this does not mean that they will worship us. It means rather that because we will be seated with Christ, they will have to acknowledge as they bow before him, our feet will be there too. We're going to be seated on the same throne. Uh, so they'll be down, down before our feet, but not worshiping us. They will have to, however, acknowledge, as he says, that uh, they were wrong and that those who followed Jesus were right. He makes a promise in verse 10 that I think has been variously misunderstood. Because you've kept the word of my patience or my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which is going to come on all the world to test those who dwell on the earth. Mm -hmm. The reference to all the world and, and those who dwell on the earth uh, it sounds fairly universal, and therefore many have thought that this is a reference to a future global time of tribulation. And those who believe in a seven-year tribulation have, have equated that with this. They say this is reference to the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. Since they say that this church is a church of our own uh, generation or of our own times, <coughs> they consider that this is a promise that the church will be raptured before the tribulation. He says, I will keep you from this hour of temptation that is coming to try on the world to test those who dwell on the earth. But as you know, from having gone through the rest of the Bible, those who dwell on the earth could be those who dwell on the land. And the world is, is a term that's used a number of times in the Bible to mean the Roman world or, or something less than the, the, the planet earth. When it says in Luke chapter 2 that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, it certainly means the Roman world. Caesar didn't tax the Incas and the Aztecs. They were on the planet earth, but they were not in the world that he taxed. The Roman world is what was implied there. Likewise, in, in Daniel chapter 7, it talks about how the fourth beast, which is the Roman Empire, should trample down the whole world. We have to understand that in certain contexts, the word world means, you know, within certain prescribed boundaries. And to, that there's a time of testing coming on the whole world to test those who dwelt in the land 
could easily be a reference to the, the very horrendous times that came on the entire Roman Empire uh, resulting from uh, Nero's death and the great upheavals, the, the political upheavals and civil wars that almost destroyed Rome in the year that followed and that this church would be preserved through that. Now to say that I will keep you from the hour of temptation, first of all, does not prove that he's going to take them out of the world. Jesus used the same expression in his prayer in John 17, 15, where he said, Father, I do not pray that you'll take them out of the world, but that you'll keep them from the wicked one. To keep from is the Greek ek teril, and that means to keep from. Jesus used it in both places. Here, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, and in John 17, 15, keep them from the wicked one. Obviously, keeping them from it doesn't mean he has to take them out of the world because Jesus specifically prayed, I don't pray that you'll take them out of the world, but that you'll just keep them from the wicked one. So, obviously, this keeping from does not necessitate a removal from the world, even if it were referring to the seven-year tribulation. What I understand it to mean is that because they have been uh, faithful to Christ, he will faithfully keep them through the time that's about ready to shake up the world. Uh, and if this was written during the reign of Nero then that time was soon to come uh, because the death of Nero was in 68 AD and that following year was a very uh, a very unstable and, and terrifying time for most people uh, in the Roman Empire because they weren't sure whether Ro whether Nero was going to reappear whether you know whether the whole empire was going to be torn apart by civil wars or whatever There's, it was a pretty pretty unpleasant situation so behold I come quickly hold fast what you have that no man take your crown oh by the way when he says to them, you have a little strength, I, I just want to make this point. Um, where does it say that? Which verse is that? Uh, verse 8. He says, you have a little strength and have kept my word. Uh, this is used by dispensationalists sometimes to prove that the church is going to be weak in the last days because this is the church of, that gets raptured, they say. And, uh, and he says, you have a little strength. So if you believe that the church is going to be influential or have you know, victory or something in the last days, they say, no, it can't happen because the Philadelphia church is the church that we're living in now, and it has only a little strength. Um, so he promises them that if they, if they are overcomers, they'll become pillars in the temple of his God, and they'll have the name of God and of the new Jerusalem written upon them, and they won't have to go out anymore. And I think that that's, of course, the temple of God is, is the church, that they would be pillars in the church, this is not the first time that concept has come up. Paul referred in Galatians chapter 2 of James and John and Peter as pillars in the church. We're all members of the church. We're all stones, living stones being built up into a holy temple. But uh, apparently a pillar is one who has particular responsibility or particular place of honor in the building. And he says, those who overcome will have such a position in my church. And they won't ever have to go out. Unlike the buildings in... Uh, Philadelphia that in earthquakes collapsed and caused people to run out of the city. You'll never have to leave the city. You'll, you'll have a citizenship in the New Jerusalem and you'll be a pillar in the temple of my God and you'll have a secure, unshakable place there is the promise he makes to them. Well, unfortunately, we still didn't get to a chapter division. We've, we've run enough over time that we have to quit now. And uh, we'll have to take the Church of Laodicea along with the, the next section uh, this afternoon. I think uh, that a, a person for, to whom that has happened is not too, un, uh, not too rare. I think that, that that's a fairly normal thing that happens in the religious life of people. But it doesn't make it good. It doesn't make it forgivable. I mean, it is forgivable if you repent. But, and that's just what the Church of Ephesus was told to do, is repent and go back to the place they'd been before, in, uh, in, to their first love. <laughs> and so... The threat to them is that Jesus would remove the, the lampstand, their lampstand, from the place where he was walking uh, if they did not return to their first love, which suggests that no amount of religious works is going to induce Jesus to put his blessing on a church. Uh, all he's looking for is love. Now, of course, love will produce works, but, but the love is the issue. The works can be there without the love, and Jesus cannot be there. And, or at least he can be in threatening to leave. And they did have the people there who did the deeds of the Nicolaitans, as we said yesterday, that it's not entirely clear who those people were, but 
Uh, it is thought by some that they were followers of a man named Nicholas who taught a Gnostic heresy of antinomianism that, that is, that taught that it was okay to sin and perhaps led people to be slack in their moral lives and still hoping that they were saved by their faith. Um, Jesus said he hates the deeds of these Nicolaitans and later on we'll find a church has the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in it. Okay, we come to the second church now, in verse 8. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things, says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who seek complaint against them in it, or call to repentance. They are a suffering church, that's evident enough. This city was the oldest city of the seven in Asia. It was founded before the others were. And um, it's modern Izmir, as I think I mentioned. At a time later in its history, Polycarp was the bishop. And not much later, because Polycarp was a disciple of John, the writer of this letter. So while Polycarp was probably not yet installed at this church at the time this was written, even if it were written as early or as late as 96 AD, which some believe, uh, Polycarp probably did not become bishop there until the early 2nd century. Uh, so some have thought maybe he was the angel of the church of Smyrna, but not likely. It's, uh, it would be a later time. But this city also had the largest Jewish population of any of the seven cities. And uh, it seems that the Jews were creating uh, a problem for the church here. Let's just look at the, church, uh, the, the letter piece by piece. He says, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now these are expressions that come from chapter 1. In the vision that John had of Jesus on the island of Patmos, he, uh, he heard these words. That Jesus identified himself in these terms. Why does he choose these particular terms to identify himself to the church of Smyrna, since there are obviously other, other details he could mention rather than these? Um, I'm not sure exactly why he chooses to mention that he's the first and the last at this point, but when he says, I was dead and now I'm alive, there seems to be a good pastoral reason for saying that because he calls upon them in chapter 10 to be faithful unto death and they will receive a crown of life just as he did and so we have a hint both in verse 8 and in verse 10 that this church was facing very severe persecution and that martyrdom was a real opposite works again to go back and do their first works again and yet he said that their labors have been abundant uh, they don't seem to be lacking in the quantity of works and it would appear that the quality of their work is deficient, and he wants them to go back and do the first works that they did when they had their first love, which seems to mean that the works that they had done before had been works that had sprung perhaps spontaneously from the love of God that was in their hearts produced by their walking in the Spirit. And it is easy for any Christian, I think, to lapse into the position that whereas when they first got saved, they were so full of the Spirit, so full of the love of God, that they spontaneously did good things, they laid down their rights for others, they, they served people, they gave to the poor, they were willing to make sacrifices just because the love of God constrained them. Um, but as time goes on, even if you don't feel the liberty to stop doing those kinds of nice things, it's possible to get into some kind of a routine of doing nice things, giving a certain percentage of your money to a religious organization or spending a certain amount of your time uh, in outreach or in other things, and to do good things, but to not do them for the same reasons anymore, uh, so that things actually become burdensome. They, you still do them. You don't allow yourself the luxury of, of giving up these projects, uh, because you would consider that if you gave them up, it would be a mark of your spiritual decline. In a sense, those things which were spontaneous marks of your spirituality when you were earlier uh, walking with the Lord uh, become the measurement of whether that spirituality is still there. And as long as you continue doing the works, you assume that you're still as spiritual as you were then, whereas in fact, it may be just the desire to be spiritual, or the desire to, to convince yourself that you're spiritual, or others that you're spiritual, that has now replaced love as the motive for doing these things. And um, we're turning to Revelation chapter 2, and we're starting at verse 8, because we took the first of the seven letters to the seven churches in our last session, along with our treatment of the latter part of chapter 1. Somehow we got off-kilter here. I, I, I prefer it if the session ends at the end of a chapter, 
it's easier to label the videos that way, and it's easier to, it's just, it's usually it's a good place to stop. Chapter vision, chapter divisions are usually, you know, logical places to quit. Uh, we've gotten off, however, in that respect. I hope that by the end of this session we'll be caught up to the point where we'll be at the end of a chapter, uh, possibly at the end of chapter three. But that means we have six letters to six churches to cover in about an hour and a half, which is not too unreasonable. That's only 15 minutes uh, per letter. I could easily take longer on most of them, but but it may be it may be that we'll say all the important things about them in that time. So we'll we'll kind of aim at that. We we saw that the first letter that Jesus dictated for John to write and send was to the letter of Ephes uh, to the church of Ephesus that was John's own church at this time in his life according to the tradition that's been passed down to us from the church fathers he spent his final years in Ephesus probably as an overseer of all the churches in the area uh, we don't know for sure that that was the case but it would make good sense and it would explain why Jesus would on this occasion give him uh, communicate to each of these churches his own church first Ephesus was a church that was zealous for truth, uh, very intolerant of false teachers and false apostles, uh, apparently abundant in good works, religious activities, um, possibly even, you know, helping the poor and things like that, good things like that, but they had left their first love, which is really an interesting thing for us to ponder because uh, he tells them to repeat their first, say that they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now this city was a very ancient city, Smyrna, and it is... From what I understand of the seven cities mentioned, it is the one that still exists as a city. And if I'm not improperly informed, there is still a small congregation of Christians there. Though, if you go to Turkey today, you'll have a hard time finding Christians. Uh, it is, of course, a very uh, dominantly Muslim country. And uh, it's rather more than a little sad to think that there were some, some major churches founded by the Apostle Paul and nurtured by no less men than Paul and Timothy and John, which churches at a later date simply gave place to Muslim, to Islam. That doesn't mean that the converts became Muslims, but the whole area was given over to Islam. And we can't imagine that that would have been permitted to be the case by God if the churches had remained worth keeping around. Uh, the suggestion, of course, to the church of Ephesus is they were, in their present state, not worth keeping around. That's why he would remove their candlestick if they didn't repent. Um, Smyrna, however, is the one, well, one of the two churches that is not asked to repent. They're not commanded to repent. Of the seven churches, five are told to repent, and Jesus has something against them. But Smyrna and Philadelphia are, are exceptions to this. This is the shortest letter, and it, one reason it's short is that he doesn't have any.